everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. I know it's been a minute since I posted anything and I got a little bit carried away with some research and I've had some real life stuff going on here lately. But hey, I think the good news is this. Uh, I've got some interesting stuff for you all to take a look at today. We're going to be taking a look at the magic system for the Wheel of Time, also known as channeling the one power. We'll be taking a look at how it works, who can channel, and some of the things that can be done by those that can channel. And then at the end of the video, we're going to be going through Robert Jordan's notes, quotes from the books, and information from interviews to create a list of all of the channelers from the books and their relative strength levels in the One Power. Now, before diving into everything there is to know about the One Power, let me first thank Audible.com for sponsoring the video. They are really like the perfect sponsor for my channel as they're the largest provider of audiobooks in the world. And obviously they carry all of the Wheel of Time audiobooks, which are read masterfully by Kate Redding and Michael Kramer. If you're brand new to the series or you're ready to do a reread, audiobooks are really a great option. I really recommend it. We have a guy in our Discord server that just finished A Crown of Swords in his first read through. Uh, and he's really taking the journey by audiobook, and it's really fun to hear him experience everything for the first time. If you want to check out the audiobooks, I highly recommend it. The best part is, just for watching my channel, audible.com is going to give you some free audiobooks just for signing up for the service, and you get to keep them whether or not you keep their service or not. Great deal, right? Uh, all you got to do is head to www.audibletrial.com forward slash enablers and sign up for the free trial. You really help support the channel and you get a free audiobook to boot. And I might as well throw up a spoiler warning here as well. Uh, this is going to be a two part spoiler video. So this first part, most of you can watch. Uh, the first part will carry a spoiler rating of yellow with spoilers through the entire series all the way to Memory of Light, but really just very, very general things about how channeling works and some of the stuff that can be done. So it shouldn't spoil anything plot related unless you just are one of those people that doesn't want to hear anything at all that might spoil something. Towards the end of the video, we will start ranking the respective channelers. At that point, I'll throw up another spoiler warning as that will contain more spoilery type material that I wouldn't want all of you to hear about if you haven't read it. So let's learn everything we can about channeling the One Power. Let's start off by just talking about what the One Power is. Uh, the one power is the power that drives the turning of the Wheel of Time. In other words, within the Wheel of Time universe, the one power is what drives the universe and the passing of time. It's an unlimited source of power and is often referred to as the true source by characters in the books. Now, the one power is divided into two halves, one called Sidar, usable only by women, and one called Sidene, usable only by men. The two halves of the power are similar in that many of the same things can be accomplished with both halves, but they are as different as they can be in the way that they are wielded. Now we can start by talking about the way the two halves of the one power are similar. The one power is actually divided into five powers that make up the whole of each half. I know that sounds kind of confusing, but stick with me. The powers are water, air, fire, earth, and spirit, representing the elements that make up the world and the universe of the Wheel of Time. Channeling the one power is described as basically weaving those flows or those... Uh, air, water, fire, earth, spirit, weaving those into something similar to like a blanket or clothing, if you want to think of it that way, but they create webs with the power that can accomplish a desired task. Different threads are channeled and woven in different quantities to achieve certain results. Channelers of Sidar and Sidene may have various strength levels with each of the five powers. For instance, men tend to be on the whole stronger with fire and earth and women in water and air, but that's not always true. Learning to channel is taught in a similar way as well as they are both taught to empty their minds minds to either create a void or focus on a flame or focus on a rosebud. But the principle is basically the same to push emotion and distractions and to clear the mind to achieve sort of like a mindfulness where they're really, really focused. This is, however, where the similarities stop. Channelers of Sidene describe channeling as seizing the power, wrestling for control of it and bending it to your will. If you lose that battle, it can be very dangerous. Sidar, on the other hand, is described as an embrace. Channelers must surrender to the power and guide its flows sort of like a riverbank guiding a river. Trying to control it would totally wash them away. The way flows of the power are woven is different between women and men as well. For instance, the weave for traveling, a talent that we will talk about in a moment, is done completely differently by men and women. Men and women can also not really teach each other how to channel as well as it's really, really different. So they, they can't tell each other how to do different things. There are some other differences as well. For one, men on the whole can channel more of the one power than can females in terms of the raw amount of power they can draw. Now this isn't always the case, but on the whole, men can control more of the one power. Robert Jordan actually described this as similar to the fact that on the whole, 
men are physically stronger than women muscle-wise, although there are plenty of women around the world that are stronger than many men. On average, though, men are stronger. It's the same with the One Power. However, he also stated that women are more dexterous with the One Power. In other words, they have better control of the flows, can do more detailed things with the power. Robert Jordan then also went on to say that although the most powerful men can channel more of the One Power than the strongest female, they are roughly of the same power level due to this dexterousness uh, with the power that women have. Another difference is linking. Channelers can link with each other to increase their ability to channel the One Power, enabling them to do more than they could alone. When two people link, their combined power is not the same as their individual power levels combined, but rather slightly less than that. But still, that's a lot more than either one could achieve alone. Women have an advantage here as Sidar allows up to 13 women to be linked together, without a man. To go beyond this, a man would have to join the link. In fact, every 13 woman link requires another man up to a maximum circle size of 72. Men are not able to do this alone. Men cannot link together without women to control the flows. Women can tell another woman's strength just by being near to her, but men can't tell without feeling for a resonance and seeing how much the other person can hold, uh, so it's very different here. Another difference is that men can sense women channeling. Men will get goosebumps or feel a tingling when women are channeling nearby, Women, on the other hand, cannot sense a man channeling at all. The biggest difference, however, is how the male half of the One Power is tainted by the Dark One's touch, a result of Luce there and Telamon sealing the boar to the Dark One's prison at the end of the War of Power. Only the male half of the One Power was used for this, so only the male half was corrupted. Male channelers from that point on would eventually be driven mad by the taint on Sidene, with many killing their loved ones or eliminating villages or just going completely nuts. So those are the main differences, and with those out of the way, let's quickly hit on who can wield the one power. Many are born with the spark to channel, meaning that they will begin to channel at around ages 15 to 18 whether they want to or not. This can be very dangerous to a young channeler if they do not receive proper training, and many will die if they are not taught to control the power. Those that survive without training usually develop some sort of block that prevents them from channeling the power outside of certain circumstances, for instance being angry, or having their life threatened. Not everyone who can channel is born with the spark, however. There is a small percentage of the population that has the ability to learn to reach the true source with training. They would not have channeled unless otherwise taught, but nevertheless, they can learn. Robert Jordan has said in an interview that in the Age of Legends, around 2% of the world's population could be taught to channel. He also said at the time of the novels, though, that number had shrunk down to 1%, which still has a lot of potential channelers out there if you think about it. The population of Andor, for instance, is around 10 million, so that would mean that that there's roughly a hundred thousand people in Andor capable of channeling the One Power. Now, obviously, most people with the ability to channel will go unfound. Once a channeler channels the One Power for the first time, this is typically followed by a sickness a few days later. The sickness can take the form of exhilaration, fever, chills, and dizziness. This will happen first about a week after we're the first time they channel, but it will get closer and closer to the time of channeling as the person channels more and more often, eventually reaching where the sickness and the channeling happen at the same time. At that point, the sickness either disappears or the person can become more ill and die without training. You can see evidence of this in, uh, in Rand throughout the eye of the world. You can see sickness on three separate occasions, even though he doesn't know that he channeled, and really, neither does the reader unless you know to look for it. It's really subtle. There are also general effects of channeling upon the the user that are very positive if they live through their initial channeling experience. Channelers age at a much, much slower rate. The more powerful the channeler, the longer that they can live. The most powerful channelers can live to be up to 800 years old, while very weak channelers can still live into their hundreds. Channeling also gives a degree of protection against sickness. Channelers who have used a binder, or otherwise called an oath rod in the books, can have their lives basically cut in half due to the oath shortening their lifespans. While holding the power, a channeler has heightened senses and can taste, see, smell, and feel to a much greater degree than others. That being said, the One Power is extremely addictive, and it's possible to pull too much of it and burn yourself out, or kill oneself by drawing too much of the power. So what are some of the things that can be done while channeling the One Power? Well, there are many uses, and in fact the main technologies of the Age of Legends revolved around the use of the One Power and engineering with its use. The One Power can be used to heal wounds or illnesses that would otherwise kill the person almost instantaneously. Objects can be floated around and penetral barriers erected ores found in the earth, fireballs thrown, and lightning called. Channelers can control the weather to a degree, create protective wards, and travel from place to place instantaneously, 
and even force others to do what they want through compulsion. Many channelers have what are called talents, which are certain skills with weaving the one power that they have a special aptitude for. Some of these talents are foretelling, which foretells future events. Some channelers have a strong degree of, of strength and healing, or even the ability to travel when they shouldn't be strong enough to make that weave. Cloud dancing is a talent, uh, which is the controlling of the weather. Some have the ability to read residues of the one power to see what was channeled in a specific area before. Shielding another from the one power is also a talent that some are more proficient at than others. Some channelers have an aptitude for lots and lots of talents, but then they, those same people can't do uh, just simple things with another talent. For instance, there are many examples of those that are very strong with the one power. They can do a lot of different things, but they can't heal more than a bruise. So speaking of strength, let's move on to the final part of the video and talk about ranking the channelers and their relative strength. Now, before doing that, let me throw up another spoiler warning. The rest of the video will have a spoiler rating of red with major spoilers all the way through a memory of light. We'll be spoiling a lot about very important character affiliations, so I don't want you to watch this part unless you have finished the books or you just flat out don't care about spoilers. Uh, you have been warned. So to really break down how the various channelers in the series compare to each other in regard to strength, we don't really need to look further than Robert Jordan's notes, the released companion uh, books, and the various interviews with Robert Jordan. His rankings of channelers evolved over time, so let me first explain the system that he used and how it evolved. At first, he had a scale of 1 to 21 that he used to dictate how Aes Sedai would defer to each other based on strength. Basically, the novels, the Aes Sedai defer to each other based on who is stronger, that decides who leads, he had a ranking for each of the Aes Sedai. Now this evolved as more characters were added and he changed it to a scale out of 60, with again number one being the strongest all the way down to 60. He then added another 12 levels of women on top of that to encompass the more powerful female channelers. And then lastly, he added seven more levels to cover the top male channelers. The scale that he has in the companion guide shows these various levels and scales in parentheses with plus signs and it's all a bit convoluted to look at. For this video, I went through the entire companion, page by page, and made a note of each channeler in the story that has a ranking given, as well as several channelers that we don't have an exact ranking for, but their strength is given in the story by comparison to other characters. There were 298 characters that I ranked, and then I made some spreadsheets to make some comparisons between the various factions and the Wheel of Time and their comparative strength. So, whew! The channelers are ranking on a scale of 1 to 79, with those at rank 1 being the strongest it's possible to be, and that 79 being the lowest one can be and still be able to channel at all. Now, a few things before I get into some of the statistics here. First of all, obviously this is just a small percentage of the channelers in the world that we got to have rankings for at all. So the list is dominated by Aes Sedai, who have a minimum level required to even be an Aes Sedai. So I would refrain from ex extrapolating that this is indicative of all channelers, as I'd say this list kind of skews higher in the strength level than the averages would be. Robert Jordan has said that channeling would follow a bell curve with the weakest and the strongest being the least numerous. And while you see that that is true, it's a bell curve skewed towards the higher end, which I'll show you in a second. There are also a few discrepancies between the companions ranking for certain characters and then what is stated uh, over and over about them in the novels. The companion addresses this by saying that sometimes the notes that Robert Jordan had were originally what he thought, and then he changed his mind as he wrote. So in the cases where there's conflicting evidence, as in the companion says one thing and the books say another, I have gone with the actual book comparisons rather than what the companion says. The two most notable examples of this are Avienda and Cadswain. Avienda is frequently compared with Elaine and Egwene in terms of potential. The companion has her three levels behind those two, and other Aes Sedai ahead of her. Now I've chosen to go with the books here, uh, and Cadswain is listed in the companion to be far stronger than Elaine or Egwene or Avienda, but the books show them to be stronger. So again, I've gone with the books here and ranked Cadswain a little lower. The last thing of note here before we get into statistics and the list is that we don't have any strength values for many of the Ashaman. I've had to use quotes comparing them to place them on this list and so I'd, I'd say that that's probably the least accurate part of the list but I think that these are pretty close. So let me start by giving you some general statistics. As I said earlier there were 298 characters I was able to either find rankings for or had enough information to rank on the list. The average strength for all of the channelers that we see was 27 which 
seems skewed high again, as I said, if Robert Jordan envisioned all of the channelers fitting on a bell curve. I think the easiest explanation for this is that we primarily spend our time with the more powerful channelers in the series, and so hence we have rankings for them and not for others. So the bell curve is basically centered on the stronger half of the spectrum. What I found more interesting was breaking down the various affiliations of the channelers. The Aes Sedai, by far the most numerous characters of which we could rank, I assume would follow the skewed bell curve towards stronger channelers, just as I was talking about, because they basically have a minimum level to even be an Aes Sedai. The lowest level that it is possible to be tested for the Shaw was the power level of 52. So let's take a look at Aes Sedai in general. The average strength for an Aes Sedai affiliated channeler was a power level of 29, which is slightly less powerful than the average for all the channelers. The median power for Aes Sedai was 26, however. For those of you who hate math and statistics, Median means that the, it's basically the midpoint of all of the Aes Sedai that were ranked. In fact, in my list, it was Tarna Fear that was ranked 26. She is the median channeler. So what does that mean? It means that Aes Sedai had some outliers on the bottom that ended up pulling the average down in terms of power. This was primarily Aes Sedai affiliated channelers that were very weak, like Margace Tricand at level 79, or a post Finn uh, Moraine at level 73. Neither is strong enough to be Aes Sedai based on their strength. If I remove them from the calculation, the Aes Sedai average actually drops to 28, which is even stronger. But what is the most powerful Aja? Well, the averages for the Ajas are up on the screen right now, and the green is clearly the most powerful with an average of 26. But this is not including Egwene, who would have chosen the green had she not become the Omelette Seed. So they could have even been stronger. The least powerful Aja is the white with an average of 30. Now the black Aja I counted separate from the Aes Sedai, and the average strength of the black sisters was on par with the others at, at an average of 28. But what about the other groups of channelers in the world? The second most most numerous group of channelers were the Aiel. There were some very powerful Aiel channelers. The Aiel had an average strength of 27 and a median of 25. Both of these scores are higher than the Aes Sedai, but we had many fewer Aiel ranked than Aes Sedai, and we tended to focus on the stronger of the Aiel. The Kin were the weakest female group, but that makes sense as they were primarily composed of groups of women that couldn't make it to be Aes Sedai. The Kin had an average strength of 40 and a median strength of 45, which puts them fairly low on the list. The Sea Folk were not represented heavily on this list, but they were overall the most powerful female group of channelers at an average of 23 and a median strength of 24. The Forsaken were obviously the most powerful group as they were all at the top end of strength level, basically by definition. Uh, so their average strength level was five and the median was three. Now, as I said earlier, the Ashaman were very difficult to rank as we we really only got strength values for two of them, but they were easy to place somewhat accurately on the list. The Asherman had an average strength of 16 and a median strength of 12, but keep in mind I would expect these to be lower in truth as we could not rank many of the Asherman's strength from the series, and it should average out where, you know, there are some much weaker Asherman as well. And so before we get into taking a look at the actual list, I'll say a few more things in general about about this list. There are some definite jumps in power here. And what I mean by that is it's really difficult to say how much stronger in the power each level is, but it's clear to a degree that there are massive jumps towards the top. For instance, Nynaeve is considered by Egwene and Elaine to be quite a bit more powerful than they are, and she is five levels higher than them. Egwene makes a comment to Rand that Moraine would be whimpering on the floor if she held as much power as Egwene did in the, while they're in the Stone of Tear. Egwene is five levels higher than Moraine. The implication is that five levels of power is quite a jump. However, when examining the other Aes Sedai, many are five levels or more higher than the others, and it isn't described as being massively more powerful. Another interesting item of note here is the power levels of the Angriol and Sa Angriol bestow on their users. For instance, Elaine has an Angriol in the Path of Daggers that she could believe makes her able to hold twice as much as Nynaeve can unaided. This isn't considered a strong Angriol, but that would imply that given Nynaeve is a level 10, and that Elaine with the Angriol could channel around a level 5, that makes her three times stronger than she would be otherwise. So a weak Angrial amplified her power by a factor of three. So a weak Angrial amplified her power by a factor of three. Lanfear had a strong Angrial and was able to equal or overpower Rand with his own Angrial, despite her being weaker in the power than him. Rand also notes later that Kalandor might make him a hundred to a thousand times stronger with the power than he would be normally. The Chodian Call is described as making Kalandor feel small to him. So that gives some idea of the enormous amounts of the power that these items can can assist other channelers in using. So let's hop into the list. I'm gonna run through this and point out some of the highlights as you guys get to see it on the screen. First thing I wanna call attention to is the affiliation key so you can kinda of see who each channeler is affiliated with. 
This is again the very bottom of our list. We've got Morgase Tracan coming in at the very last spot, number 79 on the list. We don't really have an exact number for her, but we are told that she's about as weak as it's possible to be. Maureen Damadred after the fin uh, comes in at level 73. Now we don't have a lot of channelers at this very bottom end. And so as we go forward here, you'll see that it starts to increase. Soralea comes in at level 64. She's kind of the weakest of the Aiel that we know of. Obviously not the weakest in personality, but uh, as we move forward here, you start to see more and more of the kin showing up. Again, they're weaker in the power. Level 52 is the minimum level that you can be to possibly be an Aes Sedai, and that's where we have Daigion. We've also got Andral Genhold here as well. Now, interesting thing about Andral is he is a very strong at, he has a very strong talent for traveling. You cannot travel at this level of the power you can't do that until you're up to level 30, but he's kind of the exception as he has a strong talent here. Again, more, is the, more of the kin as we move forward here. You start to see more and more of the weaker Aes Sedai here. This is where Liana and Swan fall after they've been healed of stilling. So that's really the primary people that you'd pay attention to at this point. Now, as we move forward here, you get to see the average strength for an Aes Sedai at level 36. So you're starting to see more and more of that bell curve, more and more channelers here. The only one really of note here, I think we've got Elza Penfell. She was one of Rand's group that ended up being Black Aja. And then, of course, you got Adel Adelius, however you pronounce that, at level 30 here. Now, the interesting point at this place is that level 29 is the minimum power to travel. Not everybody at level 29 can, but that is the minimum level where we, st where we start to see them able to do it. And so everybody after this has the ability to open and use a gateway. Now here's where we start to see more and more of the channelers that we recognize. And again, level 20 was where Robert Jordan originally had number one. That was his one through 21 scale starting at level 20. And so you've got Ramonda, Elida, uh, you've got Swan Sanche, pre Stilling. Amis actually falls just slightly shorter than that. And of course, you got Varen at level 24, and then Moraine at level 20, Shiriam, Liana, some of the stronger channelers at the beginning of the series. These are the stronger Aes Sedai. Now, as we move forward here is where we start to get into the very strong channelers. So level 15 is where we've got our Wonder Girls. That's Avienda, Elaine, Egwene. Cad Swain falls just short of that at level 16, along with Nicola. Now, interestingly enough, Cad Swain was ranked at level 12 in the Companion, but she's described as being lower than Elaine and, and Egwene here. Also at the top of this list, we've got Mogidian, Grendel, and then of course Nynaeve. Nynaeve is as strong as some of the weakest female channelers, although they're still quite strong. Uh, we've also got Dahmer Flynn here at level 12. He's another of the Ashman. He's very strong at healing. He's considered some of the stronger until some of the younger Ashman pass him. Now we've got the top level for females at level 8. That's the, the strongest a woman can be in terms of raw strength with the power. And so, of course, we've got Simarog, Olivia, Lanfear at this level. And then we've got Narishma at level 7. What's interesting about Narishma is he starts much, much lower on this list, but his power levels are described as jumping throughout the series where he was originally less powerful than the Aes Sedai that had bonded him, and he ends up being very, very powerful, described as being just short of Loghain. Now, Loghain, you don't see on this list quite yet. He'll show up here in a second. Uh, at the top end of this list, the top end of the power range, you've got the most of the male Forsaken. So Bilal being the weakest male channeler, but you've got Asmodian, Balthamal, Taim, Samael, Ravin, Moradin, Aginor, and then of course Demon Dread there as well. Loghain comes in at number two. Loghain was actually the only other male fit channeler on the side of the light that we actually got a ranking for from Robert Jordan, and he comes in at number two. And of course you've got Rand at number one. So guys, I hope you enjoyed my breakdown of channeling in the Wheel of Time. I apologize for the long wait on content, but life has been crazy for me here lately. I'm hoping to be back on track now. Please leave a comment and let me know what you think of the list. What did I miss? Any characters that weren't ranked that you wanted to see? I'll be posting my full list on Patreon for those of you that support me there. You can also run through the entire list there and take a look. If you want to become a patron and support what I do, please click the link in the description below. It really is the best way to support what I do here. Make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new Wheel of Time content. Guys, thanks for watching and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do 
The mistress up above, slipping on the robe of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free, crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? 